All right. Um, first and foremost, wanted to give everybody a warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this uh, beautiful evening in San Francisco. Welcome to uh, AI After Hours. My name is uh, Ulrich, and I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Encord, and we'll be doing uh, the uh, initial presentation. We have some um, amazing speakers lined up. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Soron and also from Luma, um, mostly about multimodal AI systems. Um, so uh, very excited to um, hear from both of them. And uh, of course, you'll also hear a little bit from me. Uh, my talk is going to be a little bit on the lighter side. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much technical detail, um, but hopefully it should be interesting, especially if there are aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience on how we built uh, Encord. So um, that's basically what I'm going to be starting with and uh, talking a little bit about today. So first and foremost, um, yes, as I said before, I'm Ulrich. I'm one of the co-founders of Encord. Uh, we're a 100-person team. We're spread between London and San Francisco. Uh, we raised $50 million in total, most recently closed uh, Series B in the summer of last year. And we are extremely fortunate to work with um, some of the world's most advanced AI teams. And uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the many twists and turns it took to, uh, to get the company off the ground and get us to where we are today. So uh, my objective really is to give you guys a glimpse into the, the trial of tri and tribulations of finding product market fit and scaling an AI company. Most of you have probably never seen this uh, pre-product market fit stage before, um, or you might be going through it now if you're starting your own company, if you're an investor. Um, you have also probably never seen this before, so it's always good to kind of get the, the inside spiel on like what the early days look like when it's just, uh, well, for our, our case specifically, it was just me and my, my co-founder, Eric, in, uh, in London, uh, building out the company. So I'll tell you guys the story of how we got from uh, here, uh, which was um, our landing page back in uh, 2021. Uh, back then, the pitch was automating annotation for computer vision. And you can also see we changed our name. There is a, a kind of like a backstory to that, uh, but uh, we'll keep that in the uh, bank for another day uh, to where we are uh, today, which uh, is a, a big tr a transition in the, uh, the design aesthetic of the company, but also, of course, in the messaging and, and uh, how we present ourselves to the world. So I've broken the, uh, the Encore story into three main epochs. Um, there is the building phase, the grinding phase, and then since uh, 2023 for us, uh, the scaling phase. And the building phase really started off in uh, 2021 when we went through Y Combinator in the uh, Windows 21 batch. Um, and when we started the company, we started focusing on what the main people Oh, sorry, the main problem that people had at the time in building AI systems, which was getting enough training data uh, to feed into the models. Um, we like to call this the, the data uh, quantity problem. And as you can see here, uh, we also had a very nice, uh, continuing like on the design aesthetic uh, set of slides here um, that we presented. Uh, the slide here on the right is our demo day pitch um, at YC. Uh, we had some early traction, as you guys can see, and, um, and had a like very interesting idea for how we would automate this uh, annotation process, which we uh, we're looking to solve with this algorithmic programmatic approach um, based on a technique that we developed called micromodels, which was uh, quite novel uh, at the time. So the idea was that instead of training uh, one big model to run uh, in a real production use case, you, we trained a lot of smaller models and then tied them together to automate uh, different parts of the, the training data generation, which is interesting because we're also doing some of that today, but of course, like in a much more uh, advanced um, setting. We also built a, some uh, nice, uh, a nice UI uh, with some visualization, collaboration features, and an SDK to, uh, to make it easy for people to use and adopt our micro models. And I think we even have uh, a few Encore customers in the audience. Um, so uh, you guys uh, will probably see that the, the platform has uh, thankfully developed uh, quite a bit since then. So just looking at the classic uh, Paul Grimm startup curve, like where we were uh, at the time, there was a lot of excitement. Uh, we had some like very amazing technology. Again, this was pre the chat GPT days, right? So we also had to sell investors a little bit on the promise of AI. A lot of them didn't believe us. Um, back then, people were mostly interested in investing in, in blockchain, um, how tables have turned. Um, so there was a lot of excitement coming out of YC. We raised our seed and our Series A in the, in the following six months. Um, so very, very quickly. Um, but at the time, um, and this, I think, is an interesting question for the audience. Like, how many people of you uh, here trust uh, off-the-shelf models today? Show of hands. It's actually a good number. All right. Um, so back then, uh, pre-ChatGPT, again, this was pre the AI boom. Trust in AI was was extremely low, and we were basically building AI for AI. So we were building automation for AI was even lower. So what we 
uh, saw when we had sold uh, our platforms or customers was they uh, didn't really use the, the features or the, the product as we expected it to. Um, and what we realized was that we had to solve the, uh, the trust problem, so the, the quality problem, before we could attempt to solve the, uh, the automation problem, the, the data quantity problem. So that's when we went into uh, full uh, grind mode, which was uh, 2022. Um, so the context here is we raised a lot of money um, initially, and uh, you know we had some some commercial traction, but uh, the company wasn't quite taking off in the way that we we wanted it to. So we tried to think about like how we would solve this this data quality problem, and um, I realize now that I made a typo here. It should say data quality in the uh, headline here, but we uh, repositioned ourselves as a uh, data engine, and we launched Ancrad Active which was uh, intended initially to be this automated quality assessment tool over your training data. So basically finding all the errors and all the mistakes in your data. Um, and uh, of course, like uh, use the, the software and the tool to eliminate those errors. Um, so the idea was that you could use um, our micro model to automatically generate the training data and then use active to check that the outputs were uh, correct. Now the problem was, uh, again, that at the time, uh, this was extremely niche. Um, and it was really only the, the Tesla deep learning engineers that had built uh, the Tesla data engine. And there's a, a very popular paper about this, uh, you can find online, that actually got it. Um, we also tried another small pivot. We tried to reposition ourselves as a data operating system, but really to, to no avail. Um, people just didn't really get it. Um, we were, I think, just too early for the market um, at the time. So uh, putting ourselves uh, on the, uh, the startup curve here, we were a year out from YC. Um, we'd raised the seed in Series A and our adoption was not growing as fast as we, as we really wanted it to. Um, but then of course, um, this happened. I don't know if anyone can guess what that was. It was the, the launch of, of uh, ChatGPT, um, which um, basically uh, changed everything for us because suddenly everybody became interested in AI and um, some of the early concepts that fell flat on people um, start, suddenly started making sense, and uh, people started understanding what was actually needed to um, to build out these um, uh, AI systems. So it went from being uh, lukewarm to driving the next big platform shift. Um, so our problem became instead of uh, figuring out like how to um, yeah like build the product, and, like find the customers and all these things, so like how to capture the the demand effectively, and that's when we've gone into uh, scaling mode, which was uh, 2023 and beyond. So when you have like a, a big like move in the market and see a lot of burst of, of activity, it very e it's very easy to get lost in um, you know, trying to like sell people the wrong thing they don't need and all these things, even if there is a lot of like new demand in the market. So we had to spend a lot of time honing our product, honing our messaging and thinking about what was it actually that people would, would, would buy. And uh, the way that we approached this and the way that we thought about it was, um, what are the things that will always be true in AI development? So no matter what happens in the market, what are the things that people will always uh, respond to or always need? The first one is that models will continue to get better. I think this is a universal truth. Um, we have a lot of very smart people and a lot of uh, money being pulled into um, making sure that uh, those things happen. Uh, thanks, uh, I think, in no small part to OpenAI. Um, we will always need to understand if the models work in production. Um, again, this was a very, very niche and early problem in 2022 and 2023. And the last thing is you need to weigh to manage, orchestrate, and enrich your data for training and fine tuning, uh, which of course is where we uh, came in. So looking back at our pitch deck, again, this is from our seed deck. Um, it's very interesting to see that the set of problems that we had listed out, um, the market had actually uh, caught up to. Of course, this took a couple of years to materialize. And um, what we finally arrived at, um, which is where we are today, was we had been able to solve this AI data problem in a single, what we like to call multimodal flywheel, which finally got us uh, very nicely to the, uh, um, the big billboard on the, uh, the Times, uh, Times Square, and uh, now being used by more than 200 of the world's top, top AI teams. So I uh, finally made it past the promised land into the brand new growth uh, trajectory, which, uh, knock on wood, is where we will stay um, for the next many years. So just thinking back on some of the reflections that I've had, uh, myself starting this company and scaling it out, and of course I continue to build it, is that um, building a successful company is uh, multiple iterations over time. It's rarely the first idea that you have that ends up being the thing that you end up working on. Um, you need to keep iterating on the insights that you generate. You need to really listen to uh, what the market is telling you at every single step of the way to inform the iterations that you are making. Um, People always talk about competition and status, right? Uh, but really in the early days, like your main competitor, especially in the zero to one phase, 
is not your competitors, it's the market, right? Because the market determines whether someone is willing to buy your product and whether they will use it. The last thing is that uh, the journey is not linear. Uh, for us, it took quite a bit of time for the market uh, to catch up. Uh, we were quite early to the market, but hopefully, or sorry, thankfully, I would say, we caught the market at a very interesting inflection point because it was right about to, to take off. So our timing ended up being quite good. But if we started five years earlier, probably not. Now the question is, uh, what's next? Now that we've sort of like hit it to the, or made it to the, the promised revenue growth uh, trajectory land. Um, well, the first thing is that we're scaling our customer base in San Francisco. Um, Hills did the, the billboard and, uh, and also this event, uh, only half joking. Um, but no, actually what we're doing, to, uh, trying to do is, is way more profound. So um, looking back at our kind of invariance here in AI development, uh, we've thought even beyond these things. So like what's another invariant that you also have to think about and potentially another big problem? Well. I think the biggest possible problem that we think about when we think about AI systems, especially in the context of models getting better, is that we want to make AI not just uh, do what we want, but also do what we really mean. And this is one of the hardest problems to get right in AI development right now. Um, there's another term for this, and this is most commonly referred to as AI alignment. So uh, not just like safety and alignment, not just uh, everything else that goes in alignment, but aligning the, the models to uh, do what we want and do what we need, uh, uh, or what we really mean. So iterating on our uh, invariance in AI development, what you really need is a platform or system that allows you to complete this loop, not just for training and fine tuning uh, and distillation, but also for inference. So basically like using it, uh, the outputs from a model to generate the next uh, set of inputs uh, for the next training jobs to continue to make the, the system better. That's what we like to call uh, AI data alignment. And it's very interesting to see that uh, now for our customer base, the best AI models and products are the ones that use the human usage data, so the inference, um, to inform, uh, of course, like the next iteration of uh, batch training, which generates more usage data because you get a better model, which uh, generates better models and all, these, uh, uh, and all these things. So getting that iterative feedback loop running is really how you build a winning AI product. And uh, how well you do as an AI company really depends on how you close that uh, feedback loop. Um, but until now, there hasn't really been any good solutions for this uh, to solve this end-to-end. Uh, -end. And if you think about like the modern uh, stack of how, how AI systems are built, um, it's very easy to get access to very good models. It's very easy to get access to very good uh, compute, but it's very difficult to ac get access to the right data and the right systems to build out these systems around uh, the data. And of course, like that's where we come in. So. Um, that's kind of like a nice way, I think, to, to round it out because it really completes our journey, at least like so far, uh, going from uh, data quantity initially uh, back in the early days to solving data quality to now solving uh, data alignment. And uh, we'll see what comes next. Uh, I think that's uh, to be determined. So that was, that was it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions from the audience. Can you repeat the question, sorry? What is the typical format or form in which you take the human data? Is it like humans pointing out where the errors are in your output? Or what kind of data are you getting from the humans back into the model? Um, I mean, I think it could be all kinds of things, right? So we work with a lot of generative AI customers, for example. Um, it could be something as simple as like a thumbs up or thumb down button, which would be like um, some sort of like preference ranking optimization, workflow. Um, that's like one thing we typically see, right? Or you could also, um, have a product that tests for like adversarial uh, AI models or systems. There tends to be more of like a red teaming workflow. So there are like quite a few different types of workflows that you can uh, implement in your product. Uh, you can also imagine a future where like all the data in Figma, just to give an example, right? Like people correct the mistakes um, or they provide comments on like bad designs. Over time, like the system gets smarter with um, correcting bad things essentially and like showing human intent and behavior is like what drives the improvements of the AI systems um, going forward. 